Thank you very much uh, for your very kind introduction. I have to say that uh, as a member of the national CPPCC, we observe <laughs> while, um, you know, this is an epic area for China. Um, um, mostly I'm here as a, a scholar trying to make sense of the economic consequence of the epic development. So that's the uh, uh, talk that I'm, I'm assigned by Ding Liu. Um, well, first, uh, a few words about the uh, overall uh, economic uh, policy. I think the signal is very loud and clear. Uh, China is going to enter a new era of economic development, where the objective is more on uh, the quality of growth rather than the speed. Um, so this is an epic new round. Uh, it's a new round for economic growth. It's also a new round for reform and uh, development. So we're going to continue to see a lot of reform. China is not going to settle with the current status. Uh, the new policy changes would uh, center on um, pushing for high quality growth. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a, much of a de emphasis on the speed. Uh, in the Premier's uh, uh, report, he did talk about the target of being, you know, 6.5% annual growth, but uh, there's much less of an emphasis. We're not going to try everything in our capacity to grow faster. Instead, we are going to focus more on the sustainability, on the fairness, and on the attendant cost of growth, on our, our environment, on energy consumption, so on and so forth. So the overall top-down uh, you know, uh, infrastructure for economic, economic policy is what we're going to call 1153 the four numbers, which I will talk a little bit about in the next page. There are three very tough battles ahead of us, uh, preventing and resolving major risks, systematic risks, especially in the financial sector, uh, what we call a precision poverty alleviation, and also controlling um, pollution. So the four numbers, 1153, there's going to be one general requirement, that is China's economy has shifted from high-speed growth to high-quality development. One main line is to advance the supply-side structural reform as the main line. Five major tasks. Uh, in Chinese, we call it san uh, uh, yi jiang yi bu. Three removals, one reduction, one supplement. You know, we're going to try to reduce overcapacity in certain industries. We're going to take down um, over supply of inventory. We're going to uh, reduce overall leverage. Uh, and we're going to reduce the overall cost of our uh, copper sector. And then we're going to make up for any shortages. And then the three tough battles, the last number, three, that's the prevention of major systematic risks particularly in the financial sector, and then precision poverty alleviation and pollution prevention. Um, so with those as the context, I want to uh, emphasize on the changes that I can you know, read from uh, these uh, 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 you know, high-level discussions on the financial sector. Financial sector has, in the five, la last five years, witnesses, uh, you know, very rapid growth, uh, but also uh, rapid changes. Uh, going forward, I think we're going to see major structural changes to improve uh, macro prudence and also regulatory coordina uh, coordination. As the moderator has just mentioned, there's already some reshuffling of the uh, uh, regulatory uh, institutions to better achieve these goals. Uh, the main purpose, in my mind, is to uh, focus on the prevention of systematic financial risks so as to ensure the smooth 
uh, and sustainable growth of the Chinese capital market and the Chinese economy uh, as a whole. But at the same time, we're going to see that this does not necessarily mean that we're going to see a slowdown of financial innovation. Uh, 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 to the contrary, I would believe in order to stabilize the financial market development and uh, further reduce systematic risk, we need more financial innovations in the right directions. And also this time we talked about uh, the real estate tax. It has been uh, 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 put into the government uh, report uh, by the Premier and it's hotly debated by uh, our general public after the news was released. Uh, I think the policy is being carefully studied um, before any uh, real uh, things will be implemented. There also are other things that have been talked about and uh, we have seen actions. For example, uh, there's a move to bring back some high quality financial assets from overseas back to China, the so-called CDR uh, and Unicorn. Uh, this is very much in the line that uh, our Dean, uh, Professor Ch uh, Chao Liu has talked about. Uh, there has been an observation that uh, in the Chinese capital market, generally those listed companies do not provide enough of a return to our investors and uh, we are still in search of high quality assets. Um, I study wealth management among many other things. So I want to focus my, the rest of my speech on how wealth management factors in the uh, development in the financial markets up to this point and uh, uh, how it's going to be affected by new policy uh, changes. So first of all, uh, there has been a very rapid, massive wealth accumulation in the private sector in China over the past several decades especially the last five years, we have seen substantial increase in the size of the total private sector wealth and also the development of the wealth management industry. Uh, the general public, uh, the regular households, they start to uh, be aware of and uh, you know, appreciate the impact of wealth management on their welfare as I will uh, 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 report uh, in the next several pages to you, for the regular households, uh, wealth management becomes meaningful because it can have a substantial impact on the overall wealth accumulation and on the life, life, uh, livelihood for the uh, regular uh, uh, households. There's a continued efforts for them to improve, to better manage their wealth but this is also causing some of the phenomena that we have seen in the past several years that could be attributed to uh, factors leading to some systematic risk in the financial sector. So I think the general public are very much in search of better ways to manage their wealth, better investment opportunities. Uh, but if they look within China, most of the asset classes they look into seems to not be doing a great job. In fact, quite a number of these asset classes have been you know, performing not so well and quite disappointing. Uh, you know, stock market, the bank loans, the trust products, uh, real estate, which I will talk a little bit uh, later, later, even PVC and even other exotic stuff. Uh, you know, investors are, are investing in many different kinds of collectibles, even trying financial derivatives, even though they didn't understand quite what they were doing. This caused a lot of problems. Uh, so first of all, this is a picture uh, you know, I took from a report by Bain Capital and uh, China uh, Merchant Bank. I apologize, the characters are in Chinese and the fonts are pretty small but I uh, actually believe most people here are quite little uh, in Chinese. But I will let you know uh, what I think is important on the picture. First of all, this is, this is the trend, uh, the laser doesn't seem to work. I'll just uh, point to it. From 2006 to 2017, in the last decade or so, there has been a rapid growth 
of the private sector wells. The total wells estimated by 2017, we have a number that's 188 trillion RMB. Uh, and the growth rate, the compound annual growth rate for the whole period is about 20%, several times higher than the GDP growth rate. So 188 trillion RMB, that's more than twice the size of the Chinese GDP now. Uh, the size has been growing very fast, but if you look at the composition of the Chinese private sector wealth, by the way, here the wealth includes bank deposits, capital market products, banks' wealth management products, and uh, so, some uh, overseas investments in addition to Asia's products and other domestic pro uh, uh, investments. And also, it does include investment real estate. That is, the residents, the, the houses, the real estate that you buy but you do not live in. You rent it out or you leave it open. You leave it uh, empty for, uh, you know, uh, in, in the hope that uh, in the future you might be able to sell the property at a higher price and, uh, and uh, receive an, a value appreciation. So these are invest, investment real estate. If you look at the overall size of uh, the uh, private sector wells, uh, in the last column, the 2017 estimated figures, over 50% are either in the bank deposits or just cash, earning very low returns, or in this new sector of investment real estate. So the traditional way of the Chinese hoods, house hoods are just, you know, uh, of managing wells is just put it in the bank. Now they realize that, well, maybe this is not a great way, because we're earning very low return, maybe not even covering the, uh, the, uh, uh, the future uh, uh, appreciation of, uh, of uh, commodity prices, even though, you know, uh, well, the, the CPI, we're looking at about 3% annual uh, numbers, but the bank's deposit rates are just about 3%, sometimes even lower if you're doing de demand deposit. And also, the new trend is a lot of the households are putting their surplus uh, capital into investment real estate, which in the last 10 years has been doing, you know, relatively speaking, pretty well compared to most other asset classes in China. You know, we still have this capital control policy, so it's not re re really easy for regular Chinese heads to invest uh, overseas. But if you look, you compare uh, investment real estate to stock market, to the public debt market, uh, the stock, uh, I'm sorry, the, the real estate market seems to be reasonably stable. Uh, price appreciation seems to be, well, it does vary over time period and uh, geographic regions, but overall we're looking at a healthy return, maybe 10% per year or even hop. Otherwise, it's gonna create a huge turmoil and a creek, you know, uh, and social instability. So this is the investment class, an asset class that offers reasonably good return, very low downside risk, beats most of the other asset classes. That's why increasingly we're seeing private sector wealth moving from the bank and other sources into investment real estate. But this is creating a huge problem for the future because China has been building a ton of real estate. The average households per adult, uh, 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 you know, uh, urban uh, populations, housing, you know, square footage is a very high number compared to most other economies of uh, comparable size and a comparable development stage. I'm not gonna talk about the actual number because it varies quite uh, uh, widely depending on the, on the research institution. And also, more importantly, uh, the, the housing price in China, in major cities, first-tier cities, has been so high, such that we have this question about sustainability going forward. If the, the price of the house keep going up, what's going to happen? So I think the party and uh, the government realizes this, and uh, the new policy is to try to in an orderly way, discourage more of the private sector wealth to flow into the investment real estate sector. 
And this would have so many other benefits also. And we will talk about the impact on the overall financial sector systematic risk. And by the way, this is another picture showing that the average uh, uh, household wealth and uh, per, per adult wealth uh, increase in China over time from 2000 to 2014, it actually almost quadrupled. So Chinese people really, really are getting rich. Uh, and uh, real estate, I'm sorry, and uh, wealth management is becoming important. This is uh, actually, there are some numbers here I wanted to quickly talk about. The median household in China has an annual income of uh, 86,000 RMB by 2016. The same year, uh, another estimate showed that the median or average total wealth per household in China is about 80. I'm sorry, 800,000 yen. Uh, that's the number on the, on the right. So, I mean, most of these actually are in their, the residence they're, they're living in. The Chinese households, on average, uh, has about 60% of their uh, overall wealth in the, in the real estate. Um, a better job in managing the wealth would have a meaningful impact on the uh, total average uh, uh, annual income. So for example, if they were able to, through better management of the wealth, increase the annual return by 2%, a very moderate number, that would uh, translate into about two months of average wages for the regular Chinese households. So that's why people are so interested. They work hard to, to do a better job, but this you know, uh, creates a lot of anxieties of our middle class in China. The first anxiety, as I mentioned before, is maybe I cannot beat even the inflation. So I don't want to put my money into the banks. It doesn't work. The second, actually, is maybe I'm not going to be able to beat my neighbors. They're doing a better job. You know, this is a very early stage uh, uh, capital market. Our investors are not very mature. We're better at earning the wealth than managing it. So, you know, a lot of people trading on gossips speculative trades, they have a huge herd mentality. As a result, we see hot money, large amounts of money flowing from one sector to another, often triggered by no news or very frivolous news. And also we see very ineffective and insufficient regulatory oversight. So there are a lot of problems, a lot of financial irregularities or Ponzi games or even outright crimes. Uh, these are sources for instability, for risk in the financial sector. So as a result, we see, you know, people are not doing enough of a risk management. Sometimes they become extremely aggressive in their investments, often resulting in massive loss of large number of uh, uh, people's wealth, uh, creating social instability, for example. We see huge capital inflow and outflow to and from speculative sectors. We see rapid change of asset prices. We see large fluctuations. We have concerns about bubbles in certain industries. And overall, we have a concern about instability of the economy. And also, we worry that most of the capital that has been accumulated by the private sector are not going back to support the growth of the real economy. They're just, uh, you know, uh, entertaining themselves, uh, you know, in a circle. So I think better management of the wealth would mean a lot. So we're going to, hopefully, we're going to, through policy changes, see a shift away from investment in real estate. There's already too much uh, in our regular investors' portfolio. We're going to see a reduction of leverage, particularly in the real estate sector. People, people everybody's borrowing a lot of money to to, to increase, to sweeten the return. We're going to hopefully, uh, through better oversight and investor protection, we're going to prevent more financial crimes that have a systematic impact on society. We're going to also see uh, uh, you know, encouragement of uh, direct financing, especially equity financing. Uh, and all of these would re relate to the systematic risk in the financial sector. So I guess I'm just taking a you know, particular view here that uh, reducing financial systematic risk is so important, so vitally important to our economy. 
uh, to ensure sustainability and high quality growth. And wealth management happens to be one important handle that can be used to uh, address a lot of these problems in the, uh, in the financial sector. So I just use up my time. And with that, let me conclude my talk. Thank you.